Okay. Welcome back, everyone. So we move on to our second international speaker, uh, Juliana Rangel from the United States. Um, Juliana comes from, as I said, uh, the United States. Uh, she got a PhD at Cornell University, uh, working under the supervision of uh, Tom Seeley. At the moment, she is Assistant Professor of Apiculture in the Department of Entomology at a and University in Texas, and her research program focuses on the biological and environmental factors that influence the reproductive quality of honeybee queens and drones, the health and population genetics of feral honeybees, I thought you didn't have any, according to Sammy, but no, uh, and the quality and diversity of floral sources collected by honeybees in developed areas across, uh, across the country. So Juliana will be giving a talk on the biology of mating, and when she's finished with beekeepers, she'll move on to bees. No? Oh. Howdy. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Is the microphone working? Okay, great. Um, it is an honor to be here today. I've been looking forward to coming to New Zealand since I got the invitation almost a year ago, and so I'm, I'm really humbled to be here, and I hope that I don't disappoint, although that presentation before me was a hard act to follow. But um, uh, as the um, speaker just said, I am associate professor of apiculture at Texas A&M University, and so you may not have ever heard of where uh, Texas A&M is located. So where is College Station, Texas? It took us about, what is it? 14 and a half hours to go from Houston to Auckland, where we stayed about four days before coming here. So this is the state of Texas. College Station is about right here and is, as I just said, home of the land-grant University uh, of Texas. Texas A&M has about 60,000 people, um, students anyway. And in the summer right now, it feels great because it's uh, not populated at all. All the students have gone home for the summer. And so it's also a relief to be here because it's about 40 degrees Celsius every day, 40 to 45 um, in College Station at the moment. So it's really nice to be here in this beautiful place uh, with the very mild temperature. So <clears throat> during my uh, talks, uh, this one's going to be more about biology and not so much about uh, our, our research. The last talk that I'll give um, on the factors that affect reproductive quality are um, mostly, is mostly on, on research. So this one is mostly about just biology. So first we're gonna talk about the biology of the queen. A lot of you may, not, may know many things about the biology of queens and drones, but I challenge you to look for tidbits of information that you have never heard of before in terms of queens and drones um, that are quite interesting, at least to me anyway. So we know that the queen develops from a fertilized larva that's fed a special proteinaceous uh, diet of royal jelly. And the royal jelly, um, it's full of proteins mostly, but it also has about 30% more sugar than brood food. And that's one of the reasons why queens get so fat so quickly, much quicker than workers, because they keep eating more and more. It's full of carbohydrates and sugar and uh, proteins. And it also has high levels of certain proteins that uh, regular worker brood food doesn't have, like pantothenic acid, sugar, uh, uh, as I just said, more sugar, royal lactin, which as the name indicates is a special protein for queen development. And it has a high expression of the apis mellifera tor gene, which is a target of rapamycin, which is a protein that helps increase metabolic rate and nutrition in developing larvae. So the queen is the breeding depository of all the colony's genes uh, that are acquired not just from her parents, but also from her mates. So she is in charge of depositing all of the genetic background to her progeny. It takes about 16 days, plus or minus hours, uh, sometimes even more than a day, um, 
than the 16 average days from egg to development for a queen to emerge, depending on many aspects, including the strain of the queen um, and also temperature has a lot to do. So if it's very cool, especially very cool um, days in the springtime during early queen breeding, you can delay the development of these queens by up to a day. So it takes about, of course, all, all types of bees will have three days as a larva, uh, sorry, as an egg, uh, five days as a larva. And then what changes between the different types of bees in the colony is the duration of the pupil stage. So for queens, it's about nine days, give or take. In entomology, the larval days, about 24 hours each, are, are known as instars. And so as I just said, the uh, individual would be in the egg stage for three days, and then it will um, move to the larval state for five days, and those are what we call larval instars, and so there will be five of them. And um, some of the research that I will show you uh, tomorrow has shown that the longer the workers, or we as queen producers, for example, take for the larvae to get fed royal jelly, the um, lower the reproductive potential of that, of that uh, resulting queen will be. So there is this critical age during larval development before which those first three larval days uh, during which the larvae can turn into the queen developmental pathway if it's get fed royal jelly. So workers can choose to feed uh, newly hatched larva right away with royal jelly, or they can start feeding it royal jelly on day one of larval development, two or three, and that individual will still turn into a queen. But the uh, quality will drop precipitously the longer the workers wait to start feeding it royal jelly because the less royal jelly that individual will get. After that critical period of the third larval instar, third, fourth, and fifth, no matter how much royal jelly that individual will receive, uh, its developmental fate has been established and it will develop into a worker. Probably a fat worker, uh, but not uh, one that can reproduce, and so that's what we would call an intercast. So you can have very stubby, short, uh, skinny queens that look similar to a worker. Have you guys seen those before? especially under poor nutritional conditions. Or you can see workers that can be a little bit fattier depending on uh, what kind of food they received. Um, but that, after that critical age of the third larval instar, there's no uh, turning back in terms of um, the queen's fate. So after that 16th day when the queen emerges um, in a colony that at least is reproducing um, uh, or producing queens for swarming, which is the normal uh, uh, sense of a colony level reproduction, uh, those queens don't emerge synchronously. The first one that emerges from that batch of queens that's being reared in a colony that's about to swarm will go out and seek out the other uh, queens, especially those that are, have already come out as adults themselves, and will fight with them to the death, and the workers will leave it up to the queens to do the fighting. So they don't intervene in these queen-queen duels. They allow the queens to sort it out amongst themselves because um, the better fit or the most fit of the queens will win these competitions. If you put um, uh, pairs of newly emerged virgins in petri dishes or uh, competition arenas, you will typically see that the one that is heavier, fatter, um, typically wins these competitions. Um, and if they have not emerged from their cell yet, those queens will go to the cell, poke a little hole, and sting them through uh, their cuticle and then, and then kill them while they're still developing. developing. So the winner of these combats will inherit the nest and it's ready to mate. Here we see a virgin queen that's emerging from her cell and there's one cell here with the typical exit hole of a queen that has successfully made it uh, out, out of the cell. And so she is probably roaming around looking for queens like this one to start killing and combating with. So seven days about after emergence and once the, the queen has done her, um, her uh, hardening of the cuticle, she will start taking um, mating flights 
in about 10 days, once she's properly mated, she will uh, start laying eggs. And that is all dependent on weather, and the weather conditions. If it's been cloudy and rainy for a couple of days, she will delay her mating flights, and that can be delayed up to a week, and then they will go out and mate when the weather allows. It's dangerous to go out and mate, as you will see later um, when they go looking for mates. So if she's properly mated, a queen will lay anywhere between, depending on the book that you're reading, it'll say 1,000 eggs a day up to 3,000 eggs a day. And of course, she's larger than workers, mostly because of the large abdomen that contains the uh, ovaries that we're going to look into more closely, where she, uh, and the spermatheca, the sperm storing organ where she holds th uh, millions of sperm cells. So in beekeeping, we say that, is your colony queen right? Yes or no? That means that it, the question is, does it have a, co um, a functional queen? Um, yes or no? And when the answer is yes, that queen is um, actively producing fertilized eggs, and she is constantly producing pheromones that are communicating to the colony that she's there, um, her condition, and it's doing a lot of other things in terms of colony behavior and physiology that we'll look at. So in particular, the queen produces a blend of pheromones from her mandibular glands that are known as queen mandibular pheromone, or QMP. It's a, a blend of at least five different chemicals. Uh, one of these is a mirror image of, of itself, so that's why we have four here, the short uh, names or acronyms for them, plus the uh, mirror image that makes five, produced by the mandibular glands. that are spread all over the queen's body through um, auto-grooming or self-grooming that causes behavioral and physiological changes of the colony members. So imagine that these little dots here on the queen are molecules of QMP. These workers around the queen that are taking care of her are known as the queen attendants or the queen's retinue. And so those retinue workers are licking the queen, picking up her pheromones, uh, all the while um, feeding her and also grooming her. And so the individual uh, worker that receives all of those molecules of QMP and other queen pheromones will do, again, the self-grooming, where she puts a lot of those molecules kind of toward the fore area of her body, her uh, fore legs, their antennae, their mouth parts. And they will do two things. One of them is that they will pass around those molecules to other bees in the vicinity. So it's kind of like a chain effect. So that at any given time, a worker doesn't have to come in direct contact with the queen to know that she's there. They just need to come in direct contact with at least a special or specific titer of queen fe produced pheromones to know that the colony is queen right. And through self-grooming, <coughs> the worker is also translocating some of those molecules internally, which is what causes the physiological changes inside of the workers themselves. So QMP has been known to elicit a lot of behavioral changes in uh, workers and physiological changes. I'm just going to name the three more important ones. The first one is that it elicits that retinue response that I just mentioned, where you see this is a very robust retinue with the queen being licked and cared for by the retinue workers and also fed. If you excise, or dissect out the mandibular glands, which is what we have to do to learn the chemical composition of these uh, pheromones, and you put them on um, a filter paper, you immediately get an attraction of workers, especially workers of the age of the queen attendants, which is uh, around one week of age or uh, one week old or, or so. And so it's a very potent uh, chemical. QMP also inhibits queen rearing. That's why typically we see only one queen in the colony because her presence and the presence of QMP is inhibiting any more queen rearing, except in the three conditions under which queens are reared, swarming, emergency queen rearing, and or supersedure. Under all three of those situations, you see a lower or uh, tighter or a complete disappearance of the QMP in the colony. If there is a queen, but it's under swarming conditions, 
The crowding will lower the titers of QMP per capita uh, uh, worker, but also the lack of a queen in super procedure, uh, sorry, in emergency queen rearing um, will uh, cause the uh, production of queens because there is no queen left. So typically you see these cups that are, remain unoccupied in a colony um, unless something happens like the swarming mode or the other two conditions I told you. So in the absence of QMP, uh, the workers will start the queen rearing because the inhibition has been lost. And lastly, it inhibits worker ovary development. And that's why most of the time we don't see laying workers in a colony or a very low number of them because QMP inhibits worker ovary development. How many of you have ever seen this in your colonies? Multiple eggs in a cell. So that is a huge indication that um, these uh, eggs are not laid by a queen. They're actually laid by a, a bunch of workers, rebellious workers that have become very um, selfish and they just want to lay unfertilized eggs but they really haven't read the textbook really well and so they have no idea what they're doing and they have a bunch of eggs per cell um, that will eventually if they do make it out before they get cannibalized they will develop into uh, drones so here this diagram shows uh, normal worker ovaries basically inactive and not developed uh, in the absence of a queen, you may have a few special genetic lines of workers that will develop a few ovarials with a few eggs that will turn into unfertilized, um, uh, unfertilized eggs that will turn into drones, compared to the plump, big ovaries of uh, queens. So this is a real picture of uh, laying worker ovaries compared to a virgin queen ovary, compared to a mated queen ovary, so a huge difference in size. This study actually just came out this week, or I guess last week, I'm now the jet lag, I don't remember what date it is today, but it came out in the seven days, and it's, um, I, it may be free to download, but otherwise, if you're interested, I can send you a copy of it, it's called it's by uh, Tom Wenseliers and their group in Belgium. It says, honeybees possess a structurally diverse and functionally redundant set of queen pheromones. And so they discovered that QMP is not just made up of these uh, five chemicals. And in fact, we've known that for a long time that the mandibular gland contains more than three dozen or so chemicals, a lot of which are still, I, to, to this day, uh, have been um, unidentified, but the reason why they are called the special QMP chemicals is because if you synthesize those chemicals, each one of those that I told you, the 9-ODA, the 10-HDA, um, if you synthesize them and you um, show it to workers, it elicits almost that perfect retinue response individually um, as well as when combined those chemicals. And so, but what's cool about this study is that they just found that not only your regular queen mandibular pheromones, 9-ODA chemicals, 9-ODA, 9-HDA, HOB, HVA, and the combination, which would be the whole QMP, um, when presented uh, synthetically to a colony causes a lower active amount of actor, uh, workers with active ovaries, but the same response is seen also if you show the colony with synthetic um, chemicals that are produced by the turgo glands in the queens and the, cutic uh, the cuticle, so cuticular hydrocarbons and turgo gland chemicals are producing almost exactly the same um, response in workers, which is to decrease the number of workers that would otherwise develop their ovaries compared to uh, the control shams where what they're being presented with has no QMP or queen derived components. So these novel Q, uh, queen pheromones include cuticular hydrocarbons and turgo gland esters and acids and all of those individually and in, in combination suppress worker ovary development. And so this study shows how 
uh, there is redundancy in the system so that there's now one chemical that is doing all of this suppression of worker ovary development and probably the other things that I talked about, but um, they work either in tandem or individually helping um, to maintain this process of um, queen, uh, what would you call that, queen presence in the colony. So this is a diagram of the queen reproductive organs and the important ones to mention are the ovaries of course, and the ovarials will have better looking pictures soon. The spermatheca, which is the sperm storage organ, um, and this valve fold. And it's important, the valve fold here is important because when, when the endophallus of the, of the drone goes inside, um, the bulb of the drone goes in during copulation, the semen has to go past the valve fold and kind of um, whatever makes it past this little hurdle is what will be deposited in this little pouch here. And this is what will eventually go up to the spermatheca. And so most of the semen doesn't make it past that valve fold and it oozes out during or upon or after copulation. This is also important during artificial insemination of queens. When you're doing it with the little tiny needle inseminating a queen, you have to go past the valve fold with your syringe so that when you um, insert and inject the semen, it doesn't come out of the queen. And you can actually see it if you haven't made it past then it comes out, all the semen comes out of the queen instead of staying inside. It has to go inside past the valve fold. So the queen, this is uh, more of a vertical view with uh, the top of the abdomen here and the tip here with the stinger and or um, egg laying machinery here and the two ovaries with um, two lateral groups of ovarials, which are those sausage strings that contain the eggs. There's about 150 ovarials per ovary, but um, the number of ovarials depends on the quality of the queen. So there are queens that have 120, 130, some that have 170 uh, or so ovarials per ovary, meaning that they have a higher or lower egg laying capacity. And so these um, tubes converge kind of here at the end and depending on the cues that the queen is getting based on the size of the cell, so if it's a certain size for workers or a certain size for drones or even a certain size for the cups where uh, queens are being reared, then she will determine whether to uh, fertilize or not that egg and then lay it. So this is a real picture of what that ovary looks like with those nice long sausage string ovarials compared to the sausage strings of of, or ovarials of a uh, laying um, worker ovary. This is a diagram of how eggs are produced in a queen. Imagine if you had a queen that was born with all the eggs that she would ever produce in her life. Imagine that she lived three years, and so that's roughly, let's say, a thousand days, and let's say that roughly she laid a thousand eggs per day, that's a million eggs, right? So if she had, was born with all the eggs that she would produce, she would have to hold a million eggs in her abdomen. So imagine the size that that abdomen would have to be. Not very um, natural and realistic. So instead, she produces eggs as she goes and uh, as needed. And so that's a really cool thing about egg production in queens is that this is the tip of, if you look at that vertical picture that I just showed you of the uh, abdomen, um, these, this is an ovarial, this will be at the top of the abdomen, and this will be here at the, at the bottom, close to where the egg is going to be laid. And as you can see, these cells differentiate into nurse cells, which are next to the actual egg that they, uh, will be eventually laid by the queen, and these follicle cells. And so there's 48 of those nurse cells that per egg that will feed the egg as time progresses. And as the egg becomes bigger and bigger 
and more of these mature eggs get laid, it's kind of a conveyor belt and those eggs are gonna be moving closer and closer to the bottom to be laid. And as they do so, they will continue their growth. And so the egg will travel toward the oviduct as it matures, being fed by those nurse cells. And then ultimately the nurse cells are reabsorbed into yolk. And that's how the queen keeps that egg production going because it's not just She's born with all those eggs. She is uh, producing eggs as she goes from each one of those ovarios. Now let's talk about the spermatheca. Um, this is a picture taken by Sue Kobe, who's a dear friend of mine. How many of you have heard of Sue Kobe? Yeah, she is probably one of the world's experts in instrumental insemination of queens, and uh, she goes all around the world to get um, semen from drones of different uh, strains. And so this is a picture of a spermatheca. It's typically covered by a uh, tracheal net or a net of tracheae that oxygenate the spermatheca um, to maintain the semen upon copulation viable for however long that queen lives, one, two, three years. So this is the spermatheca of a Virgin queen, it's kind of like a saline solution inside, and then um, the spermatheca of a mated queen full of semen from her many partners. And so something very interesting from a paper that came out uh, in 2009 is these um, um, Alawati et al. measured the number of sperm cells, which we do in our lab a lot, and I will show you some of our research. Um, tomorrow on this, um, showed that the, the fast depletion of sperm in colonies uh, 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 on, after only one or two years. So for these particular queens, the zero-day-old queens, or zero-year-old queens, or the, uh, the newly mated queens had about three and a half to four million sperm cells in the spermatheca, which is uh, 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 average number, but after a year, it, the number went down to about a million and a half sperm cells in the spermatheca. So more than half of the sperm had been utilized already a year later. And then some of those that made it to a second year uh, had about only a million uh, sperm cells left. So this is one of the reasons why there is queen replacement in colonies because queens run out of sperm or at least viable sperm as I will show you tomorrow. So viable meaning that it is usable for fertilizing an egg. So as queens age, everything that happens with aging is happening with queens, but on top of that, um, they're running out of viable sperm. Something interesting about sperm too. Um, you have queens that are newly mated, and if you were to take some of the contents of the spermatheca and look un under the scope, uh, you see that the sperm is tightly coiled in little circles, and it moves in circles like this, like little worms. They just go around and around and around, and you see them coiled with each other, moving and moving, just going like this, very tightly coiled. That's the sperm in a newly mated queen. Can you guess what this is? Sperm in a one or two year old queen. So not only do the queens run out of sperm uh, over time, but because there is more room in the, in the spermatheca, the, the sperm now distends and looks horizontal like this. Um, but not just that, it moves slower. So here's the speed, if anyone you know, could think that you could measure the speed of a sperm cell inside a spermatheca, there are crazy people like that that will dedicate a lifetime to doing that, myself included. So uh, in micrometers per second, so newly mated queens have a speed of about 35 micrometers per second and they're moving in a circular motion Whereas these distended, horizontal looking sperm cells after one or two years have dropped to about half the speed. So fewer sperm cells, slower sperm, all due to aging uh, in queens. 
So that was what I wanted to mention about queens. Now in terms of drones, we probably know, all, all of you here in this room know that it takes about 24 days from egg to emergence for, um, for drones. And that it takes about 12 days for these drones to reach to maturity. That's what the book says. I argue that the book is incorrect, at least in maybe in the part of the world where I live, but it's also in other parts where people are looking at drone biology. It looks like this is a, um, uh, maybe at the lower end of the spectrum, but it takes probably more like 18 to 20 days post-emergence for drones to reach their full um, reproductive capacity. So therefore, there's a minimum of 36 days from egg until you get uh, reproductive capacity in drones. In reality, it should be more like 40, 45 days for this process to happen. Something very interesting and different between queens and drones is that, as I said, for queens, they're not born with all the eggs they'll ever lay. They are produced as the time advances and as the eggs are needed. But in drones, they're born with all the sperm they'll ever need. Why? Because they're only going to use it once, if they're lucky. So they're not going to have to replenish um, their existence uh, of, of uh, sperm because they're only going to use it once. So all the sperm is formed before the drone emerges. And what we call sexual maturity is the, t the time it takes for that sperm to migrate to the seminal vesicles that, so that the sperm can be used by the drug. That's what we call sexual maturity. It's not that the spermatogenesis is happening after emergence, it's that it is moving locations from, from the testes to the seminal vesicles. And the colony only produces drones in a colony during re the reproductive season, tightly linked to the production of queens because they are basically flying sperm cells and their uh, purpose is to um, inseminate virgin queens. And so only if a colony is um, strong enough will it have the ability to produce the very expensive drones that it uh, would need to pass on its genes in terms of um, drone production. Weak colonies will not produce drones, and that is a good indication of, uh, of, of the weakness of the colony or maybe the use of the colony. If it's a small split, it probably is it's spending its time growing instead of producing um, drones. So young drones are typically fed in the, in the middle of the brood nest area. If you're looking for drones, and you're looking for young drones, you will find them in the middle of the brood nest area. Um, they are typically fed by workers. Once matured, they start moving to the periphery of the boxes of the, of the combs where the food is located and they start feeding themselves. So then when they become, or they're about to become sexually mature, just like queens and, and workers, they take orientation flights to get used to the landmarks and learn uh, their bearings, and then they leave the hive to mate um, every afternoon or so if the weather permits. In the fall, though, because they are only used for reproduction, they will be evicted from the colony by workers. They will be um, starved and kicked out completely because they are no longer, no longer serving the purpose of reproduction. There are no more queens to mate with and they're so expensive to maintain that it is better to start the process again next spring than to keep these drones alive for months before um, new queens are produced months later. So they typically die before winter. Um, the drone's abdomen is huge compared to uh, the worker and it's because it's holding inside all the reproductive organs, including um, the testes, the seminal vesicles, the mucus gland that will produce the very important mucus that sits atop the uh, bulb that we will see later, um, onto which the semen is um, uh, placed right upon ejaculation. So we call it the endophallus, endo inside phallus, male reproductive organ. It's always 
tucked inside, endo, inside, until that drone sees, smells, connects with a queen, and then he uh, averts the endophallus, and typically uh, all of this very complex structure comes out, all of or most of these organs or um, parts of the endophallus are useful in reproductive um, tasks, including sperm competition be between, um, between um, drones. So it is speculated that some of these hairs during copulation will help remove sperm from the previous mates uh, so that once sperm can be the one that is in higher quantity than the previous competitors. And this bulb is what's going to stay inside of the queen. Mature drones have about 10 million sperm cells or spermatozoa in their seminal vesicles, which amounts to about half a microliter of semen. But in reality, a drone only contributes way less than a million sperm cells to the spermatheca. This is an averted bulb with the semen. This is the mucus here and the semen that looks kind of cafe au lait in color right here as well, sitting on top of the mucus that keeps it alive. And this is what you collect with a syringe when you're doing instrumental insemination. And that's the part that goes into a queen during copulation. So a filled spermatheca contains about 5 million sperm cells or so if she is well mated or anywhere from eight to 10 microliters in volume, which tells you right away, also one of the reasons why she will need to mate with so many drones is because she needs to fill up that spermatheca with uh, enough volume of sperm, and she can only do that if she mates with uh, more than 10 drones at a time. Some math about drone production. If you had a frame full of drone comb, just draw, drawn out comb, you would have about uh, 4,000 cells on for in, accounting for both sides. But you know that not all of those cells are used, so about 3,000 of those drone cells would actually contain drones. And if you say that on average, um, a queen will mate with, let's say, 15, 20 drones. Then the drones from one full comb of drones produced will be sufficient to mate with um, 175 queens. But we know that that's really not realistic. Typically, what we find in colonies are small patches of drone pr produced, uh, drones produced, right? So that number goes dramatically down, and it also shows why sometimes there is um, a shortage of drones in colonies to mate with uh, all the virgin queens, especially in areas where queen production is predominant. So to finish off, we'll just put these two together, the drone and the queen together. The drones um, <clears throat> uh, convene in drone congregation areas where thousands of drones meet from nearby colonies um, and they await for a chance to mate. This is a picture, a famous picture of a queen that is tethered by a helium balloon and there are people uh, that are DCA whispers and they know where DCAs congregate and they will look for those DCAs and they can be located anywhere up to about a mile or so from the hive. Um, they typically congregate about 10 to 40 meters above ground and represent any number of, of nearby colonies. If you have had uh, three, four days of bad weather, you will immediately see the complete disappearance of the drones in your colony trying to look for um, mates. DCAs are very stable, both spatially and temporally, and they follow geographic contours, but there's really no general rules. People that have seen them before, and I have to admit, I have never seen one. Has any of you seen a DCA? Four people, good for you. So it is known that if a DCA is formed somewhere, it will probably be there the next year. And of course we know they, they're not the same drones. So they're following the same innate rules, internal rules of where to uh, gather up, but it's not the same drones. So there's no memory of where it used to be. 
This picture shows in, uh, in the squares apiaries, lo apiary locations in two different scenarios, and the little dots are uh, locations of DCAs. So in this particular location, there were a lot of apiaries in only a few DCAs and only in this area of the general geography, whereas here we have about 10 DCAs surrounding only one apiary, which shows basically not much. It just shows that there's a lot of variability of where and when DCAs are formed, and they can be um, basically a combination of drones from all sorts of colonies. Something that just recently came um, out uh, looking at uh, DCAs is whether or not DC, uh, drones in DCAs have varroa mites on them. And we know there's a lot of drifting going on. And what they found is they were comparing um, uh, European honeybee apiaries and African or Africanized apiaries in uh, Florida. This is out of the University of Florida. And they found that indeed there were significantly higher uh, varroa, numbers of varroa per hundred um, drones based on the proximity of that DCA to managed uh, either European or African colonies. So the ones that were really close to the European apiaries only had about half a varroa per hundred drones whereas the ones that were about three kilometers far from the uh, ap managed apiaries had about three drones per hundred varroa. And so that can indicate uh, a source of dri drifting. They also showed that DCAs from managed European uh, honeybee apiaries had more African drones. So the farther away from managed known European uh, colonies that the DCA is located, the higher the incidence or the presence of Africanized drones, which can have a huge direct impact on the material, the genetic material that the, the queen will mate with, compared to the DCAs located close to managed apiaries, where there was only 2% Africanized bees um, or drones in DCAs that were really close to those managed apiaries. So drones will emerge sooner in the year, earlier in the year, and stay longer in the year than queens, looking for every, the first early bloomer and the late bloomer queen uh, to mate with. And they will also emerge earlier in the day and stay later in the day trying to mate with queens versus queens having a more stringent schedule potentially to avoid drifting and or um, getting killed. So during copulation, the queen, um, the, the drone will mount the queen, the lucky drone will mount the queen, finally avert the end of phallus and insert the bulb. And as he does so, and when he's done ejaculating, he lets go of the queen, but the bulb stays inside the queen. Very similar to what happens during a worker stinging a victim, uh, it, the, the drone, falls to the ground, dismembered, and dies soon thereafter, leaving what is known as a mating sign. So in this little video, you see the queen, the drone kind of not very gently bumps her, and finally using those, the, the legs and the claspers uh, gets to hold on to the queen, and finally ejaculate, and as soon as he does so, he drops at leaving the mating sign. So you can see right there, the mating sign, the drone dies soon thereafter. Um, and so the sperm goes in, see the valve fold right here? The semen goes past the valve fold and only that semen um, that made it past it is the one that it will make it eventually up to the spermatheca. It takes about 48 hours for that transfer or the this movement of the of the semen from the queen up to the uh, spermatheca and finally we have that mating sign so it's very interesting but it it is a sign to subsequent drones that that queen is still available for mating and the drone will go take out the mating sign insert his endophallus and the bulb leave it inside then drop to his uh, death 
while the next one will then remove the mating sign and do it uh, so on and so forth until the last sign is removed by the workers inside of the hive and either that queen may leave the next day for another round of matings or she will she's done and she will never mate again so queens for many reasons that we will talk about tomorrow mate with many drones and that is basically the process that each one of those may, uh, queens undergoes um, during mating so beekeepers need to understand the biology of queens and drones as well as the colony cycles in order to manipulate colonies to our advantage and to know what is going on inside the colony during the reproductive season, especially if you're interested in rearing queens um, because we need to know when drones are becoming mature. And a lot of times we have substandard queens or undermated queens because they made it in a time when there were not enough um, uh, mated, uh, sorry, sexually mature drones to mate with. And so for that, it's really important to attend talks like this, read up and, and learn about the biology so that we don't get any um, surprises. So for example, we have a queen rearing workshop every year in my lab that is very well attended that talks about all the biology of queens, drones, uh, et cetera, um, at a &M. So thank you. This is um, a pleasure to be here today with you. And, um, we have a very active Facebook page, so Tamu Honeybee Lab. Um, I guess I ran out of time, but I'll be here uh, for the next three days to uh, entertain any questions you may have. Thank you.